Yes, yes, yes. Welcome, welcome. What up, what up? How's everybody doing? Um, first and foremost, hope you all, if you're listening, had a wonderful, happy Christmas, um, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever you celebrate. Hope you were able to do that uh, with your families, those of you who have immediate families close to you, whether you don't, uh, if you don't, uh, hopefully you're able to maybe get on Zoom or talk to them on the phone or whatever, because you know the holidays is the time of family. So hope you're able to enjoy that safely and happily. Now, on to what we got today. We got a special episode of the Format Podcast. Joining us is 13-year NFL veteran and Fox Sports radio host, Ephraim Salam, who's going to come on in and tell us all about all things NFL. He's going to give us some cool stories about his time in, in high school and college and in the NFL. And uh, then he's going to, you know, give us some discussion about this year's season, what he sees happening in the playoffs. So that's going to be a real good discussion. Hope you guys enjoy that one. But before we get to Ephraim, let's go ahead and knock out the particulars. Now, you know, you can find me a lot of places if you're on social media. First and foremost, you can find me on Twitter. That's where I'm most active. And that's at Bruce F A hope. That's at Bruce F A hope. If you're on Instagram, that's going to be at the format podcast at the format podcast. If you want to email me, you can email me the format podcast at outlook.com the format podcast at outlook.com. All right. If you want to just listen to the audio version of this podcast, I'm available in all places where you can find your audio podcast, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, CastBox, Podbean, Spotify, whatever. We're all there. And wherever you listen to your pods, that's where you can find this. If you are going to listen on iTunes, please do us a favor and give us that one, two, three, four, five, five star rating okay that five star rating helps more than you think it helps us move up in the rankings so we can continue to bring you this content all right it's got some really good stuff um 87 episodes in you can check out the back episodes if you like we got a lot of different things okay um if you're listening on youtube please make sure you click the subscribe button in the lower right corner of your screen then click the bell so you can be notified when uh, new episodes are available for you to watch and or listen. Um, also, uh, going back to iTunes real quick, if you want to listen that way, please make sure you go over there. And in addition to the five star rating, please give us a review. All right. Whether you love the show, hate the show, it doesn't matter. Just love the interaction, because even if you hate the show, that lets me know you're listening. All right. I'm running through this pretty quick because if you can't tell, I'm pretty excited to get to the main show and the interview with Ephraim Salam. So with that, sit back, relax, and listen up to episode 87, closing in on 100 of The Format. Joining me on the format podcast today, I, I have a special guest, somebody I've been looking forward to talking to. I have 13 year uh, NFL veteran and co host of the Fox Sports radio show uh, with Brian No, Ephraim Salam. Ephraim, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Thank you, brother. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's get right into it. For, uh, for my listeners and viewers who may not know too much about you, just give me a brief intro. Um, where you're from, how and when you got into football, a little bit about your NFL career. Uh, all right. Like you said, I played 13 years in the NFL. I played for f- I, five teams. I say four because I, <laughs> I, I, I count the I don't count the year. I played for the Detroit Lions. So <laughs> technically five years, I mean, five teams, mm-hmm. uh, but really four. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I'm I grew I was born in Chicago, but I grew up in in California. Okay. Uh, Southern and, and Northern California, Los Angeles, and then moved up to Sacramento. I didn't get into football. I didn't play Pop Warner. I didn't play any sports when I was young. Mm. I was a cereal eater and a Nintendo player. <laughs> that was those were my two things that. <laughs> Like if I could get paid to eat cereal right. and play Nintendo, right. that's what I wanted to do when I was right. younger. And it wasn't until my freshman year in high school, after the first day of school, at the end of the day, I had a good friend, John Hellman. And he had the only Nintendo on the block. <laughs> and this is up in Sacramento at Florin right. High. Now let me interrupt you for our listeners. Okay. That's not Nintendo Switch or Nintendo. No, oh, no, 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 no. Nintendo. Nintendo. The NES, original. Right. The first one. <laughs> Duck Hunt. <laughs> it came with Duck Hunt and Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> yup, yup. <laughs> uh, and I remember I was so excited because the whole summer we were playing The Legend of Zelda. I and we were that. almost, we were almost about to beat it. <laughs> right. And I couldn't, I was like, I all through school, this is my first day of high school. And the mm -hmm. only thing I could think about was getting home to John's house and finishing Zelda, saving the princess. Right. And so after school, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. I'm like, where is John? And so I go around the back and I see all of these guys coming out. They've got, they're holding their shoulder pads and the helmets. And then I see John. And I'm like, yo, what are you doing? We got to do the Zelda. He was like, oh, we got to wait a couple hours. I got football practice. Mm -hmm. I said, where did you start playing football, man? <laughs> so I'm sitting in the bleachers, upset, mad, watching practice. Waiting At to play the end Zelda. Of pra <laughs> this is just a real, this is right. This is a, this is a true story. Right. At the end of practice, John comes over with the head coach. And he says, coach, this is my friend Ephraim. Mm. Can he play football? Wow. And the coach was, was like, uh, have you ever played before? I was like, no, I, I've never. Do you want to play? And I was like, yeah, I, sh yeah, yeah. And they were like, okay, come <laughs> with me to the office. I go to the office. They gave me a permission form. And then I had to get a mm -hmm. physical. Mm -hmm. And like two days later, I'm in football practice. Mm -hmm. I play nose guard. Oh. I'm, I'm playing nose guard. Mm hmm uh my freshman year at the end of the season i got moved up to to jv john myself and another player got moved up to jv it was a brand new high school so we only had ninth and tenth graders so we didn't even have varsity we just okay. had a freshman and a jv team mm -hmm. i got moved up to jv for the last few games and from that moment on my football life began. It was that next year after the season, I played varsity that next year as a sophomore. I was 14, I believe. Yeah, 14 years old. And I only played half the season because I broke my wrist. But at the end of the season, I played nose guard and I think offensive tackle or something like that. Hmm. At the end of the season, Coach called me into his office and said, hey, I got something for you. And I was like, what, what, what do you know? He said, I got this letter. So he gave me this letter and I'm looking at it and it says the University of Illinois is fighting a lion eye. And it had like um, a football helmet. It had a football yeah, helmet on yeah. it. So I was like, what is this? And he was like, just, just open it. <laughs> so I'm opening it and I read right. it and it was like, it was a questionnaire. Mm. It was a first, the first she was like, uh, hello, uh, Mr. Salam. This is, uh, you know, the athletic department of Illinois University. Mm -hmm. And we're reaching out to you because you're on our radar. Please wow. fill out this questionnaire and yada, yada, yada. And I was like, yo, what is this? And he was like, well, this is called a college letter. Mm -hmm. And you're on the radar of a university to possibly get a scholarship in football. Wow. And I was like, yo, what? I've been playing football a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how did they find me? It was like, I, they just find people. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking around that year with that letter in my back pocket the whole year. 
Like it was part of my outfit when I got dressed. You know, you wake up, you take a shower, put your shirt on, your pants or your shorts, and then I would put the letter. The letter was sitting on my. I just put the letter in my back pocket, and just walk around like it was a big deal to me. I'm 14 years old. I don't. I'm a kid. Right. And from that moment on, I really started taking football serious. And wow. my junior senior year, to just the influx of of, of letters just start coming in, coming mm-hmm. in, coming in, and that was really the beginning of, of, you know, my football career. So what was the biggest school that recruited? Well, let's say the big, na- the biggest name school that recruited you for college football. Oh, I mean, there was Oregon, there was Tennessee, there was okay. uh, Kentucky, Illinois. There was, it, it was, I got recruited probably about 85, 86 division one colleges. Oh, wow. Okay. In basketball and football. I was going to get to that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, I would have to go, I, I actually, I have uh, the majority of those letters to my mom kept them and she sent them okay. to me not too long ago. Wow. So I have like a big duffel bag of, mm-hmm. of letters uh, in my storage unit mm-hmm. that uh, sometimes when I'm feeling nostalgic, I'll go sit in there and, and peruse what, what <laughs> used to be. Right. 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 You know, so, ba- back, mm-hmm. back in the day, Back in, back in, hold on one second. Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. Um, it I would just go and, and, and peruse it just to make myself feel good. You know what right. I mean? Like, you know, hey, I, I used to be something or, or uh, just silliness. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I still have all of them. <laughs> I still have them. I, I, I like to get my nephew. So when my nephews were young and they were in high school and in sports, Right. I used to take them in there and sit them down and let them look at the letters and let them see what was possible. Mm-hmm. Right. No matter where you are, how small your school is or what, if you have the ability, they will find you. And I kind of used it like a, but like a tool, like a mentorship tool for them. Mm. Okay. Um, so you mentioned basketball. We'll digress to that real quick. Um, so you hooped, you played a power forward, what, six, seven? Six, Hold seven, on right? one second. Let me get my my audios together. This is this technology's. I'm <laughs> old, so technology's killing me. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. You're fine. Oh God, I can't. Hold on one second. That's what happens when you got phone phones and computers hooked up to the. To the, to the same thing. You got you got me now. Say something. Yeah, you're good. I'm you're back. Right. I'm back. Okay, good. All right. Slipped up to my phone. The phone ring. You take it off the computer. They okay. go back and then. I got you. But don't edit this. Keep this going. This this is real <laughs> life. This is real life, people. <laughs> All right. So just because you said that, now I'm not because I'm sitting here thinking, yeah, I'm gonna have to go ahead and cut this. No, nah, no, nah, don't cut up. none of this, man. This is, this is the real deal. This is what right. you want, right? This is, this it. is real. This is real. It's real. So yeah, no, I was saying you're you're six foot seven, right? So back then, six, you, probably, yep. you probably would have played what power forward when you were in high school. I was a uh, power forward mm-hmm. and a center. Okay. Um. I was really skinny. So when I graduated high school, I was 6'5", 185. So how were you on the line at 185? I was but, an athlete. But that was a long time ago, though. So, that, But that was an athlete. I didn't. I got recruited one school mm-hmm. in the country, recruited me as an offensive lineman. Okay. That was San Jose State. And I remember... San Jose is not that far from Sacramento. Okay. And I remember they offered me an official visit and I said, no, cause I don't want to waste my visit. Mm. Cause you, you only had, you only got five visits, I, I believe. And I didn't want to, or three visits. I can't remember what it was, but I didn't want to waste a visit to go to San Jose state. I wasn't going there no way. And they wanted me to play offensive line. But what they said was we got a game coming up you and your dad can come down and be our guest. It won't be an official visit. Okay. So I remember going down uh, to that game and standing on the sidelines and watching. And then the coaches come up to me afterwards, like you could be, you know, an all league offensive lineman here. And I'm thinking mm-hmm. I'm not about to be no offensive lineman. I get after <laughs> the quarterback, baby. I play outside linebacker. Okay. 
and defensive end mm-hmm. as as well as tight end sometimes as well as t- tackle as uh it didn't matter like mm-hmm. what you find in high school if you're an athlete you very rarely come off the field right they're gonna get you in all types right of special teams see, yeah. you, you just out there you young mm-hmm. you can go forever <laughs> right right and, and and so that was the only school that really recruited me to to play offensive line everybody else wanted me to be a, a stand-up linebacker or a defensive end okay so where'd you end up going? I went to San Diego State. Okay. And people would say, well, why did you go to San Diego State when you got recruited by all these other schools? I was thinking that. <laughs> that was my next question. Of course. It's only one reason I went to San Diego State. My best friend, mm-hmm. who I grew up with, we lived together when I was in high school. His name was Dion Taylor. It's my brother. Like, we okay. grew up. Right. That's it's my brother. Um. He was a phenomenal basketball player. He actually got me into basketball. And he was heavily recruited. And he got a a full ride scholarship the year before me. I graduated in 93. He graduated in 92. Okay. He got a full ride scholarship to San Diego State. It was, he was either going to go to Purdue Mm -hmm. or San Diego State. And he didn't want to go that far from home. Mm -hmm. So he picked San Diego State. Once he got his scholarship and went to school, I knew where I was going to school. Wow. So he he could have played with Glenn Robinson, but he didn't want to go too far from home. That's crazy. That's that's that. And if he would have went to Purdue, guess where I would have went to school? Right. Right. Purdue. And so. That was the decision for me to go to San Diego State was because my best friend and brother graduated a year before I did and picked San Diego State to go to school. So I went to San Diego out. All the letters and the coaches were coming. I remember my my junior and senior year and I was just waiting for San Diego State. I was just like. And the thing is, at the time, Marshall Falk was going to San Diego State. Okay. And so when my brother was there, right? So when my brother was down there, he called me, was like, yo, this dude out here is nuts. Right, right. They got this kid named Marshall Falk from Louisiana. Mm -hmm. I ain't never seen nobody right. And I remember him like, yo, I want you to meet this dude. So I would be, and this is before cell phones, this is landline, right? Right. right. He was like, when you get home from practice, um, uh, you know, call me. Call me in my in my in my dorm room. So I would call him and he'd be like, hold on. He had a cordless phone. He would walk <laughs> next door mm-hmm. and be like, yo, Marshall, this is my brother E from me. Play football. And and he would put he put me on the phone with Marshall. Like, yo, wow. hey, you know, boom, boom. Yeah, we rocking and rolling down here. So I was like, yo, this is crazy. Right, right. Uh when when I got my official visit to to, to San Diego State, mm-hmm. um, we so for those who don't know your official visit goes like this they offer you a visit you officially say yes and then they make travel arrangements their travel um uh travel coordinator will call you be like hey we want to put you on this flight that flight or this flight you pick one when you get here you'll be picked up by someone from football operations Mm -hmm. Depending on what time you get there, I got there in the afternoon. They said, we'll go get something. We'll get some lunch. We'll get some lunch. Uh, We'll bring you into the locker room so you can see the locker room. And then the next day you schedule your meetings and stuff like that. But they want you to have that first night to hang out with the players and, you know, somebody will host you. Right. right? right. Somebody from the team, somebody from the team will host you. So I was like, okay, good. So I fly into San Diego like around 3.30. We go right to a restaurant. They got a nice setup. It's me and some other recruits. They're like, hey, anything you guys want, you guys dig in. So we're eating, we're eating. All the while, I'm biding my time. I'm like, okay. Remember, this is no cell phones. This is right. 90, this is 92. 92, 93, somewhere in there. No cell phones. So I'm like, okay, cool, cool, cool. So we go over to the football operations. They show us the locker room. And I was like, oh, this is cool. They give us some swag. Mm -hmm. Then we go, uh, the player who was hosting me, we go to 
the it was called the Villa. The Villa Alvarados were all in San Diego where all the athletes stayed. It was crazy. It was like a it was it was dope. It was all these apartments. It was part of the campus, but it was off the campus. And so I knew my brother was staying in there. Mm -hmm. So once I got there, I went to his apartment, Mm -hmm. knocked on the door. He like, yo, the rest of the time I was with him. Right. The dude who was hosting me didn't know where I was. (laughs) Nobody (laughs) in, in, in football operations knew where I was. Oh my gosh. They panicked because they didn't know where I was. Wow. I was gone. I was, we were doing, we, I'm with him. We over at this girl's dorm. We over there. We at the movies. We hanging out. Just, it's just me and him. We just, Mm. my brother. I remember that next morning at like, so the whole Saturday. So I got there Friday, the whole, no. Yeah. I got there Friday. The whole Saturday I was with my brother. Sunday morning. I, I mean, Sunday afternoon, I was supposed to leave. Sunday about 6 30 a.m. Mind you, I just probably went to sleep 20 minutes prior to this knock on the door. <laughs> so I, I we get a we get a knock on the door. Right. And he goes to the door like, hello. It's like the head of football security, uh, one of the coaches, uh, the guy who was supposed to be hosting me, they're all standing at the door. <laughs> and they were like, is he, uh, is he from Salam in here? And then he comes to give me, say, yo, I, I have some, some people at the door. So I walk over there. I'm like, oh. <laughs> they were pissed. I know they were hot off. Yeah. They were pissed off. Mm-hmm. They put me in that damn van, drove me to football operations. It took me into the head coach's office. It was Al Luganbill was the head coach at the time. And he was like, I can't believe you. This is, <laughs> I can't believe you took advantage of us and wow. you had no intentions and you just wanted to come down here and be with your friend. And he's going on and on. He's just getting it all out. He's just getting it all out. This is disrespectful. I'm going to tell everybody that you're disrespectful. And wow. he's just going on. And I'm just sitting there like, you got to remind, this was, I'm 16 years old. So mm-hmm. I graduated high school at 16. Okay. So I'm si- wow. I'm 16 years old and I'm just sitting there like I'm yawning as he's mm-hmm. yelling because I'm tired. I've been asleep for 20 minutes mm-hmm. in two days. And he's like, look, you don't even care. You're young. <laughs> you you want to go to sleep? Well, we're gonna get we're gonna we're gonna get your ass on the next flight, and you don't ever have to worry about coming here if I'm boring you. And I was uh, like, but I'm going here. Right. Right. And he said, you're good. (laughs) He said, what? I said, I'm going here. Right. Well, what what do you mean? I said, this is the school I'm in. And back then they had letters of intent. Mm -hmm. So at the end of every visit, Mm -hmm. they would give you a letter of intent. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to sign this letter of intent? Right. The states that you have all the intentions of coming to here when national signing day comes. Mm-hmm. right at the end of every visit and i was like because this is my third trip i've been i went to oregon and i can't remember where else i went but this was my third trip so i was like do you i'm like eyes closed i'm like do you have the letter of intent and he was like oh. <laughs> he's, he's looking around and he, it was on the clipboard he put it in front of me I signed my name and was like, yo, I can I go get some rest before my flight? And they were like, yeah. <laughs> well, yes, it's good to have you aboard. <laughs> uh, we're so glad you're gonna be an right. Aztec and, and yada yada. Like I had already the, the, the tune changed real quick. <laughs> look, they 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 didn't know I knew. Right, right. I, I knew that, you know, what I was doing, they didn't know, but that's mm. how I got to San Diego State. Sorry okay. for making that that w- one question, a long story. No, that, was, that, that was a good you know. story. I like that. So um, obviously you ended up, you stayed there three years or four? I stayed there, uh, I redshirted. So I stayed there five years. Okay. So five years and then seventh round yep. draft pick number 199? One pick 199 
in the 98th in the 98 draft i was a seventh round draft pick i was pissed mm. off i was projected to go in the third round hmm. what happened i thought that? i w- i thought i was going to the jets okay the scout for the jets lived in san diego mm-hmm. and we spent a lot of time that from january to april of 98 we spent a lot of time together. He would come check me working out. Mm-hmm. We go lunch, have lunch. You know, I'm sure he was looking at other, doing other people, but this was his region. Mm-hmm. He was in the West region. And right. so he was like, uh, you know, we got to bulk you up. You're, I was like 285 at the time, I guess. And he I, he was just like, but you're an athlete. And um, I actually played basketball my junior year at San Diego State as oh, well. Wow. Okay. So I was one of the only division one uh basketball and football players mm-hmm. offensive linemen at least mm-hmm. i know uh, a couple years prior tony gonzalez, tony gonzalez. Did it. yeah but it, a lot of people weren't doing it at that time and so i got a chance to live out that dream because i was actually recruited by san diego state as well to play basketball okay so it was kind of like a dual scholarship situation and the majority okay. of schools that i got recruited by did the same thing one week their football coach would come to my house. The next week their basketball coach would come to my house. Oh, wow. So they would hit me back and forth, back and forth like mm-hmm. that. So I end up fulfilling that dream in my junior year playing basketball at San Diego State. Mm-hmm. And so that was one of my positives on my recruiting, on my, my uh, 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 you know, my uh, my my strengths and weakness, weaknesses of my scouting report was mm-hmm. as an athlete, play Athlete-er. basketball. And so the Jets, he was like, oh, man, we really, really like you. And draft day, I get a call from him. And back then, the draft was the first three rounds on the first day and then four through seven on the second day. It was only okay. two days, Saturday, right. Sunday. So I remember first round going, second round going, and I remember getting a call from him. Mm-hmm. Hey, from how you doing? It's been a while. Um, just making sure you're in shape. You're ready to go. We got a third. Uh, we got a third round pick coming up. We're gonna take an offensive tackle. We're we're gonna take you mm-hmm. at the offensive tackle spot. Just keep your phone, you know, handy. By then, cell phones were out. They were the Motorola cell phones, and I was like, I'm, I'm on it right now. I got you. I, you know, I'm ready. And. Uh, so I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. I told everybody, hey, that was a jet scout. They said they were they gonna get a tackle. So we all looking and we just like <laughs> right, right. And, and I remember uh the Jets pick is in. Uh mm-hmm. they come to the table and and with the whatever whatever pick in the third round, the New York Jets select Jason Fabini, uh offensive lineman, offensive tackle from wherever Jason went to school. Uh, who turned out to be a heck of a player. So nothing against him. But then I was like, wait, what? Right. And then from there, it was just all downhill. Mm. I remember waking up the second day, fourth round, fifth round, sixth round. And at the time, I was like, you know what? I'm done. I turned the TV off. Me and Dion, Dion was with me. He was in town with me. Mm. And uh, he was already out of school. And... He was overseas playing basketball in, in Germany. Okay. And it was his off season, so he had come home. And I was like, man, we out. We was on our we was in the car on our way to the movies. Mm-hmm. And my cell phone ring and I pick it up. I'm like, hello. He was like, uh, Ephraim. I said, who this? Who this? It's Art Shell. Oh. I'm like, right. <laughs> oh, oh, hey, hey, coach. He was like, uh, I'm just letting you know, man, uh, we have uh, the next pick and we're, we're going to pick you. Pick up. Before that happened, I was getting a lot of phone calls from different teams, including the Jets. Wow. Hey, you didn't get drafted. This is your opportunity mm-hmm. as a free agent to pick where you want to go. Okay. Keep us in mind. We like you. We want you to come and 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 to training camp and be part of this. And Mm -hmm. I was getting those calls, so I was pissed off. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. Fast forward back to Art calling like, 
Yes, because I thought it was one of those calls. That's why I was answering the phone, like, yo, what? Right, right. And and he was like, Yeah, we're getting uh we're getting ready to draft. And I was like, the draft is still on. And he was like, Yeah, you I was like, Well, what round is it? What what pick are we on? Like, he was like, You're not watching. watching. <laughs> right. He said, You're not watching? I said, No, man, I'm out. I'm on my way to the movies with my brother. He said, Well, we got the 199th pick in the draft. And look, I've been trying to draft you since the fourth round. All right. And I finally saw you still on the board. And I went in there. I was like, I'm picking this kid. And so we're getting ready to draft. And I was like, well, I appreciate that, coach, but I'm pissed off. And he said, good. Mm-hmm. He said, good. And he said, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come into training camp and prove to everyone in this league mm-hmm. why they messed up on you, mm-hmm. including us. Mm. because it shouldn't have taken us this long Mm. how was that does that i said that's fair and that's all i want is an opportunity right and two minutes later 199th pick in the draft atlanta falcons now if i'm not mistaken tom brady went 199 too didn't he two years later he (laughs) went uh two or three years later he went 199 but Mm -hmm. There were more picks in the draft by then. Right, because he was sixth and round. So he was in the sixth round. Yep. So even though he went 199, I'm a true seventh rounder. Like I I I I that I hold that badge up high because <laughs> the, the draft was literally about to go off. Right. Like it was turning off. And it was mm-hmm. just like, you know, I got put into the category of the commentators talking, talking, talking. Oh, let's go back to the last 20 picks. And then they just put it up on the board, right? You know, and anybody of notoriety, they would say, and I just saw my name up on the board, like 199, 200, 201, like the the nobodies. We're, we're right. the nobodies. And um, that's how I started my career, man. That's how I got in the door. And hung around for 13 years, which means you did something right. Um, The thing that started my career when I got to training camp was I had this attitude. I had a chip on my shoulder, like, mm-hmm like F the world, right? Like I was pissed off. I knew I could, I I could play. Mm -hmm. And so when I got to camp as a young player, the first thing I did was I learned the playbook. Right. And any young players out there who listen to this or watching this, learn the playbook. Once you know the playbook, there is a level of, uh, of comfort when you're going into practice, because you know what's going to happen. You don't have to think football is seconds, man. You only get seconds to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was like third on the depth chart behind, I was playing left, the third string left tackle. Mm -hmm. And our first string right tackle, his name was Corey Lucci. They had just brought him in from Buffalo. He'd been in the league five years. They gave him a bunch of money to be a free agent. He was a free agent, uh, right tackle. And he uh, he pulled his groin. So they had to shuffle the line around. And they were like, okay, well, we, you know, the 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 guy who was second team over there moved into first team and he had been in the league three years. They need to see who was going to play with the with the second group at the right tackle. Mm-hmm. I never, I was a, I was a left tackle. So, <laughs> They, uh, all the young players, Art Shell call us up to the board one at a time, uh, run this play, right? You mm-hmm. got to draw every, everything up, put it on the board. Not just your position. Mm-hmm. You got to draw every position. Okay. I was the only, I was the only young player that knew what every position, every play he did, every, everything he called out. I drew up every right receivers, mm-hmm. quarterback drop, everything. Mm-hmm. And then he said, uh, all right, tomorrow your second team, right tackle. Wow. Okay. And. That was like the second week in training camp. And from there, we got to the final preseason game. Mm -hmm. And Corey had come back from injury. Mm -hmm. And I had been having a good training camp. And Art, I think we were playing the Cincinnati Bengals that last preseason game. And Art came to me at the beginning of the game, Corey and myself, and said, look, Corey, you're going to start. Ephraim, you play the second quarter. Corey, you'll play the third. Ephraim, you play the fourth. Whoever plays the best starts next week, opening weekend. That's it. And I was like, oh, yeah. 
<laughs> right. A 50 50 shot. Right. You mean all I got to do is go out here and ball out and then mm-hmm. and I can get it? Mm-hmm. It was over. See, I took it one way, he took it another way. Because mm. he had been in the league. Right. He had, they had just paid him like a half a million dollars to sign, which was a lot of money back then. Yeah. And so he was like, yo, what, what, what you talking about? And I was like, yeah. That's what I'm talking, right? I'm here to compete. <laughs> he went out. He went out there with that mindset and had a bad game. Mm. I went out with the different mindset and had a good game. And it, not that it was great; it was just better than what he did. Mm. And that next morning, I'll never forget. I was I woke up. I was going down to breakfast, and I saw Corey coming back. And I was like, "What's up, Corey?" And he just walked right past me. And I was like, well, damn, fuck you too, Corey. I mean, the <laughs> F you too. I don't know if you can yeah, cuss yeah. on this, but. Uh, and I remember in the team meeting, I was looking around and I was like, dang, it ain't nobody. And where's everybody at? And I was like, oh, they're about to start the meeting. Somebody get Corey. Bob Whitfield, who ended up being like my mentor, my big brother. He was like, oh, they cut Corey ass. Oh, damn. I said, what? And then right when that happened, Art Shell's uh, Ephraim. He called me out and he was like, look, I don't know if you know this, but we just cut Corey Lucci. And uh, that means you're our starter opening week against Carolina next week. Uh, mm. And I'm going to give you two pieces of advice. Don't be afraid to be successful and don't go out there and piss down your leg. <laughs> wow. get, back in, get back in the meeting. Wow, and that's how I st- that's how I started my 13 year career right then and there, and I started for the next 10 years. And you started at right tackle, you said. My first four years in the league, I started at right uh-huh. tackle. So and then when I went to when I went to Denver, uh-huh. I moved back to my natural position of left tackle. So so with mm-hmm. that, with the time you came in the league, I guess that would have mm-hmm. been 96, 97 around 98, 98. 98. Oh, yeah, five yep. years. Okay, 98. Yep. So you would have caught maybe, I guess, Reggie White right at the end, Bruce Smith right yeah, at the I, end. So my first year, mm-hmm. I played against uh, Kevin Green. That was the name uh, I was looking for also, yeah. Yeah, Kevin yeah. Green, who yeah. just passed away. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, shout out to, to Kevin, his family. Tremendous player, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, just a, a heck of a guy. Yeah. Heck of a guy. Whoop my ass that first game. <laughs> I'm sure. Whoop my ass. I gave up two sacks. We won the game, mm-hmm. but they were in our division and we played them a second mm-hmm. time and I got him. So, mm-hmm. you know, that, you know, I, I got that get back on. Him. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had to play against Bryant Young. I had to play Ooh. against Michael Strahan. Right. I had to play against Jason Taylor. So some all-time against... great pass rushers. How was that? It was a learning experience. <laughs> it was a welcome to the NFL right. moment right. for sure. So, so every yes, week, this, um, you, you, I think, yeah, you would have had Bruce Smith at the end of his career. How was, was he still that good? Beast. Did you see him slowing beast. down at that point? Or? No, it was no slow down. It was beast. <laughs> it was beast. I was right. one, I was one play. Okay. Away from playing against Reggie White. Oh man. Okay. And in the divisional round of the playoffs, mm. one play. Right. Think back. Now that year at the Atlanta Falcons, we went 14 and two. Mm-hmm. We're number two seed in the NFC. Minnesota was the number one seed. They went 15 and one. It's Randy Moss's right. rookie year as well. Yeah, yeah. Randy Moss, Chris Carter, uh, Jake Reed. Yeah. That's Randall team. Cunningham, the whole nine nope. yards. Mm-hmm. Now, San Francisco and Green Bay were playing. Um, they were playing in that um, wild card round okay. of the playoffs. And if you remember, I'm watching Reggie White just destroy mm. people. Like, I'm like, oh, God, this is. <laughs> and if you don't remember the Super Bowl prior, it was Green Bay and the Denver Broncos. Right. I do. And Reggie White was annihilating that tackle. Mm-hmm. And I remember watching that as a as a a, a, a college senior. Mm-hmm. Like, damn, I hope I don't ever have to play against Reggie White. 
Right. Like I'm sitting there thinking, like I hope yeah. I don't ever have to play against Reggie White because right. I'm a hundred, I'm 285 pounds. Mm-hmm. Reggie White is literally just slamming 350 pound linemen back and forth, just attacking the quarterback. And I'm like, right. yo. So I'm watching that game like this. I'm like, oh my god. Mm-hmm. Green Bay is up. Do you remember the cry catch from To? Yes. Yes. That the, the, was the that game. That he, yeah, that he, yeah, right. At the end of he'd the been, game. He's been dropping everything, and then he caught the game the winner. Right. end of the game, yes. they throw that pass up. Steve Young throws mm-hmm. that pass up. In the end zone, double yeah. cover, T.O. catches the ball. And holds on. <laughs> he was crying. Yes. I was crying. I was like, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, right. I did not want the smoke. I can tell you that. I did not want to go against the minister of defense. I, I didn't want any parts of that. So so here's something that I've always kind of wondered about. I've debated with other people, but you would be the person that I've spoken to now who would be closest to this question. I think that could give a fair answer. Prime Bruce Smith, prime Reggie White, who's better and why? I'm a Reggie Bruce Smith White. guy. I, I love Bruce. Okay. Bruce is loose. I remember him on the cover <laughs> of of Sports Illustrated, yeah, right? Yeah, I remember yeah. that article, reading that article, the Bruce mm-hmm. is loose. He was one of my favorite players. Okay. Because I, at the time, I was a defensive end and an outside right. linebacker. So right. I'm like, yo, this Bruce is whoo. <laughs> and, but Reggie White, mm-hmm. Reggie White had a move no one could stop. Mm. Now, Bruce was athletic and mm-hmm. physical and, mm-hmm. and intelligent. But Reggie White was like, I'm going to go there and you can't do anything to stop me. The bull rush. And whenever you're going against someone like that, Mm -hmm. there's a level of panic that goes, that courses through your body. Okay. And I, I mean, just watching him, there's a reason why he has so many sacks, Mm -hmm. right? Right. There's a reason why at the time he had the all-time sack record and mm-hmm. uh, uh, seasoned with like di- it didn't matter how good you were as an offensive lineman, he was going to punish you. Mm. And I would I would give that in a close race to Reggie White. Okay. Okay. So now before we bring it to uh today's NFL and we get into some analysis from you on that front, one more question as a, a longtime NFL O lineman. Um, and this is a question I actually asked Leon Searcy maybe last year. Walter Jones, Orlando Pace, Tony Baselli, Jonathan Ogden, who Ooh. and why? There you yeah. go. See, I, I like these kind of questions. I like these. And now, again, you Bruh, and like what? I said, I asked Leon Searcy about this. So you would be the next best person. That Leon I could was ask raw too. Question. Yes. Leon yes, he was. was. A beast. Yes, he was. Um, oh, I forgot Joe Thomas. So if we want to throw him in there, Joe Thomas, Joe Thomas is, <laughs> was is tremendous. Yeah, I, for me, I would say, man, bro, I don't, man. I'm biased. I'm a Ravens fan, so I'm, I'm gonna go with Jonathan Ogden. See the thing with, mountain, with Jay, the thing, the thing, the thing with Jo is, and who's a great friend. I go uh-huh. every week, every summer. I go to Vegas and host his, uh, his, uh, his benefit. The okay, uh, at risk kids. Okay. So, you want to talk about the nicest, kindest, goofiest guy in the world, <laughs> but bruh, right <laughs> on that field, yeah, yeah. Jonathan Ogden was is six nine, yes, three seventy. The mountain, yes. We <laughs> play the same position, right? I'm six seven, two ninety, right, and that's we a big play man. the same position. <laughs> He makes right. me look like his little nephew. That's crazy. Yeah. Even yeah. when we're standing next to each other mm-hmm. today, mm-hmm. I still look like his little nephew. Right. I kind of take him out of it. Okay. Because how do you like he's so out of the spectrum of like nobody <laughs> okay. is that. Okay. Like nobody is that. He's mm-hmm. in a class of his own. Okay. Walter Jones is mm-hmm. probably one of the most athletic tackles in the history of yeah, football. Go with that. Mm-hmm. His feet, he was so smooth, mm. right? He 
when he got out of his stance, it was like a dance. Mm. He was always under control. It was no wasted motion. So he okay. was just like, he would be floating out there. And I would be like, <laughs> how? How does he like, do I'm, that? I'm, I'm out there panicking. I'm crossing over. I'm trying to get over here. Mm -hmm. And he was just, he was effortless. Okay. He was effortless. Orlando Pace brought that. The king of the pancake. <laughs> he brought that. I'm going to lean on you yeah. and crumble you. Mm -hmm. He was so fast at the point of contact. Mm -hmm. He caught defenders off guard, which allowed him to have better leverage. Okay. Okay. Right. And that's what produced a lot of those pancakes because he was so quick. Now okay. I'm going to put somebody on that list. You forgot. Okay. Give it to him. Willie Rofe. Oh, okay. Willie yeah. Rofe. Yeah. What? <laughs> Kansas City, now right? You, Kansas City and yep. the Saints, both. Yep. Now, people always ask, how come you never made a Pro Bowl, Ephraim? Those gentlemen that you just named. <laughs> Took up all we, the tackles. We all played in the same right. era. Right, right. At that, at that time, no one did not go. Everybody, if you made the Pro Bowl, mm -hmm. you went to the Pro Bowl because the Pro Bowl used to be played after the Super Bowl. Right, right. So now the majority of the Pro Bowl players are actually playing in the Super Bowl mm -hmm. so the alternates come. Yeah. Back then, those guys didn't miss the Pro Bowl. Mm -hmm. I've been alternate like three, four years. Not one time have anybody I was an alternate for us was like, yeah, we're not going this year. So when you're in the era of Orlando Pace, Walter Jones, Jonathan Ogden, Willie Rofe, Tony Baselli. It's hard. When, <laughs> when you're in that era. Yeah. We're Leon Searcy. Like we're mm -hmm. not to mention, uh, um, um, what's his name? Allen from the Cowboys. Um, Oh, Larry Allen. Larry Allen. 700 pound bench press. <laughs> right? Right. 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 Th this is the era I'm yeah. playing in. Yeah. It's no way. Yeah, I was good, but they're great. All of them great. They're all going in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Yeah. So there was no space for little old me. Right. As good as Bob Whitfield was, he made it only two times. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, so. Bob was better than me. So I'm like, damn, if Bob ain't making it out, no, I ain't gonna make it, right? So that's just... <laughs> right. That was the era. So I can't pick a, a a favorite or who was the best. Okay. Because they all did something. Now, I will say this. If Tony Baselli would have stayed healthy, mm -hmm. he had the ability to be an all-time great. Like, the, mm -hmm. he was a, just a technician. Right. I remember him going against Jason Taylor on Monday Night Football with one arm, mm -hmm. and he was just dogging Jay. Mm -hmm. And remember, he was backpedaling down the field like, "Come on, like keep it coming, let's go." And I was just like, yo, <laughs> "Right, yo. right." His show messed his shoulder up. He couldn't yeah, I, like. Yeah, I, I live in Jacksonville, and he's um he, he's pretty popular down here. Yeah, yeah, man, that dude was a monster. Mm -hmm. He yeah. had the potential to be all time great, like for real. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate that insight on, on some of the all-time greats on both lines that you played with or played against and competed against in your time in the NFL. So um, let's get into some talk about uh, the current day NFL. Um, so let's start with last night. Buffalo really took it to the Patriots. They, they mm. put it on them. Um, so a couple questions. First, was that beat down kind of taking their pound of flesh out of New England for all the years of abuse at the hands of Belichick and the Patriots? Of course. You know? <laughs> of course. Wouldn't wouldn't you if you had Oh, I would, but I'm I'm foul. <laughs> let me ask, let, <laughs> let me ask you this. Do, do you yeah. have a big brother? I do. Right? Did your big brother used to beat on you when you was little? <laughs> well, he, he beat me in hoops. Every time I never beat me. He, he's almost as tall as you. He's a big dude. I never beat okay. him in basketball. So if you had an opportunity to beat him in basketball, would you just beat him or would you try to destroy him? I would try to pour it on. <laughs> That's that is the what happened last night in that right. in that football game. Right. Buffalo Bill 
for the last since 95 yeah Mm -hmm. has been the little brother yeah and new england has been that older brother just slapping them down slapping them down slapping them down yeah so once you get an opportunity to step up to your big brother right and pour it on right i thought they was gonna score 50 on them (laughs) yeah if they would have left josh allen in that game right they would have scored 50 on them Right. They would have put up a 50 ball. Mm-hmm. So how good are the Bills this year? Now, oh. is this kind of the perfect the perfect storm with them? And we'll talk a little bit about it later. But is it a function of New England is down and they have now, an influx of really good skill players? They've got good play callers. Is everything kind of coming together or are they really as good as they look? It really doesn't matter what New England was. Okay. And I don't want to take anything away from what the Buffalo Bills have been building for the last three years with okay. Josh Allen. Mm-hmm. We saw this last year with the Buffalo Bills. <clears throat> you got to remember, they're a playoff team. Right. Josh Allen, when they drafted him, everybody was like, out of Wyoming, like, who is this dude, right? Yeah. Big kid, yeah, strong yeah. arm, highly, wildly inaccurate. Mm-hmm. Credit to Josh Allen for this offseason in a time where this was a, a ragged offseason. Mm-hmm. You couldn't practice COVID. What Josh Allen did was he worked on his mechanics. Mm-hmm. The delivery of the football, his footwork, his hips, his shoulder, all of these things, elbow, all of these things that the common, the the, the layman fan wouldn't know. Like it's like, well, how come we can't get the ball in where all of those things affect to where you put the ball? He took the criticism Mm -hmm. and he worked on it. He jumped up 10 percentage points in accuracy. That's a crazy jump over one year. It's impossible. Yeah. It's impossible. I I heard uh, Peter King talking about that with Colin Cowherd today. It's it's, it's, it's impossible. It is, yeah. People will be like, oh, well, it is almost impossible to do. Obviously, he did it. It's not impossible. But the work he put in... Buffalo was already a team building something. The fact mm-hmm. that they went out and got Dick Stephon Diggs. I was about to bring that up. Man, look. A legitimate look, number I, one receiver there. Yeah. A, a legitimate number one receiver mm-hmm. for a legitimate number one quarterback. Right, right. And Buffalo has always been a physical team. They just always had, hadn't had the talent. Now they have the talent with the physicality. Mm-hmm. So this is no flash in the pan. This okay. is the next, this is the Buffalo for the next five years. Okay. This is what that looks like. This is something that they've been building to, to now we're seeing the fruition of all of their hard work. So here comes the bigger issue. Um, it's easy to build it, put it together when you got a quarterback on their rookie deal. Mm-hmm. They're, if Josh Allen continues like this, they're going to have to pay him. Then you start seeing, okay, is he a quarterback that can carry a team because you're not going to be able to put as much around him with that hard cap that they have in the NFL? How do you see that? you know, coming about, obviously maybe, I don't know if they pay him after this year, but they will certainly have to pay him after next year. How do you see the team looking then in terms of, is he good enough to carry them when they're not able to pay all these different guys? Um, so to play in Buffalo and to want to play in Buffalo, <laughs> right. you got to want to play in Buffalo. Oh. Right. Mm-hmm. It It's Buffalo. Like, you can buy a city block in Buffalo for like 40 grand. <laughs> right. right. Like it's not right. New York. Right. It's not New Jersey. It's right. Buffalo. Mm-hmm. West, Western New York. Right. And so Josh Allen fits there. Right. We may see the same approach depending on their success this year and next year that Tom Brady had. Mm. Right. The approach was, Tom Brady has always been paid under market value. Mm -hmm. Now the problem in New England was they never really brought anybody in. Like, so I don't know where the money. What did you do with that money? Yeah, like I don't know. Everybody's got the same question. What did you do with that money? But look, we we can't we can't argue that because in twenty years they won six Super Bowls, so we can't we can't they they did something correct. Now, Buffalo strikes me and Josh Allen strikes me as that type of leader, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I want to keep this train going. 
Okay. So whatever I need to do, he will be compensated greatly. Would he take the max or would he be, would he do something team friendly to where he can keep the pieces, mm. right? Keep the pieces to where they can continue to build and really take advantage uh, of that division like they did in the 90s. Right. So, so you're a player and I know I've talked to a few players about this and I've, I've never heard a player advocate for taking less to keep a team together. I know your Fox sports radio colleague, Rob Parker is absolutely adamant against players taking less. He always Mm -hmm. says, Hey, get every penny you can. It's up to management and that front office to work everything else out. Kind of where are you on that? Would you, recommend that Josh Allen maybe take a little hometown discount in order to keep the team together. Now, when you say, when you say less, right, we're talking the market value is probably going to be upwards of 35, between 35, 40 million. I think it's probably already there. Yeah. So for, well, not for, not for everybody. Right. Right. Not for everybody. Like Patrick Mahomes, than everybody else. Right, right. Right? So it's not, that's what the problem Dak Prescott was having. He wanted Patrick Mahomes' money, but he hadn't done Patrick Mahomes' things. Things. (laughs) Correct. Right? So you got to keep that in context, Mm -hmm. right? So if Josh Allen says, hey, I'll take 36 million a year Mm -hmm. and not 38 million a year. Okay. Right? Are we sacrificing that much Right Personally, now, they I can also think so, but it's easy they can, for me to say. I'll, but, I'll but wait, never but, see that kind but, of money. But wait, what they can do uh-huh. is what they did with Patrick Mahomes. Okay, if we make it to the Super Bowl, mm. million dollars. Incentive. We win the Super Bowl, a million dollars. Right, you lead the league in passing, a million dollars. Right. So now that thirty-eight, that thirty-six million, has the potential to be forty. Mm-hmm based on how the team performs and you perform. Mm -hmm. Now you're only going to be able to perform as good as your roster. Right. That's how they play that game. Right. Mm. Like you have a potential to make $40 million this year. This is what you got to do. Right. Just what you normally been doing. Right. And you can add whatever incentives. If you have, you know, two times as many interceptions, like, uh, I mean, touchdowns to intercept any, you can put anything in there you want. Right. Right. That's how you recoup that money that doesn't go against the salary cap. Why do you think Patrick Mahomes signed for five hundred and something million dollars mm-hmm. for 10 years? A lot of that, the only guaranteed portion of that is one hundred and forty million dollars. Right. Right. That's what they have to pay him if he mm-hmm. never played another down. Right. Right. Everything else. Right. It's just there. Right. In, 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 in totality, it seems like a lot, but it's right. only like one hundred and forty six thousand guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Now you can be creative with Josh Allen and you can set up now if he believes in himself and he keeps taking jumps like he did from year two to three, then yeah, you can sometimes potentially make 45 million in a year, depending on, you know, what you guys do. We win the division again. That's another million dollars, mm-hmm. right? You know, you make the pro bowl. That's $500,000, right? Mm-hmm. If we have a receiver that leads the league, you know, that's another $500,000, right? So he has to be willing to, to to do that to help keep this train going on the right track okay fair enough um so along the lines of josh allen we're also hearing a lot about brian dayball his offensive coordinator slash i think he's also the quarterback's coach up there in buffalo Mm -hmm. um we're hearing about him being a real hot candidate for a head coaching job this offseason so where i'm going with this is is brian dayball as good as he's looking right now or is, like I said, is Buffalo just kind of in the perfect storm this year? And we're also hearing about Eric Bieniemy, the OC for the Chiefs. Mm-hmm. If you were a GM, you're looking at an, a, a head coach uh, candidate, would you prefer Brian Dayball, Eric Bieniemy? Is there another candidate out there you really like? We're hearing the name Ron Sulla. Um, mm-hmm. Where are you in terms of those those names? Well, Robert Sala from... Uh... San Francisco. From San Francisco. Mm-hmm. I know Rob. Okay. Tremendous, tremendous coach. Student of the game. Seems like it. Right? Mm-hmm. Now, Brian Dayball, if I was, if I were him, I would stay put. Okay. Why would you stay put? They, because they got something good going. Now, 
there is an increase in whatever he's making, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to pay you as an assistant head coach and an offensive coordinator. So we're going to increase your salary to make you happy and comfortable. Mm -hmm. We don't want to take you away from Josh Allen when he's just getting it. Okay. Right? Give us one, two more, two years. Mm -hmm. Give us two more years with Josh, the same offense, the same uh, terminology, everything. Let's keep, let's let him become elite. Right? This is, Mm -hmm. this is what I'm, and if I'm Josh Allen, I'm like, yo, B, we got to stick together. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but we got us. We got to stick together. It's me and you. Well, there's right. Also the old strike while the iron's hot. If you're Brian Dayball, right? Your name is. Yeah, out but you there. gotta. But you gotta look at it like if I stay, mm-hmm. this kid. If you if he believes in Josh Allen, the iron is going to be simmered. Look at Eric Bieniemy. Mm-hmm. That iron been hot over there for a long time. Has it cooled down any? No. Mm. It's still hot. Mm. Eric deserves to be a head coach. He will be a head coach. I think he probably right? out this this year right so my first pick would be robert sala because i know him okay and i know how much he puts into it eric Mm -hmm. the enemy because he deserves it Mm -hmm. and then i would if i was brian i would stay in buffalo because they got a hell of a thing or they could take control of that division even though miami and brian flores is coming they could take control of that division Mm -hmm. for the next five years so, right. Look what look what Josh McDaniels did, is doing in, in New did in New England. Mm-hmm. Right. He was supposed to be out of there five six times. Right. He right. actually took he took the job in in Indianapolis yep. and then was like ah yeah, I'm come good. back and stay <laughs> right. and won a Super Bowl. Right. Right. So every and I say this all the time, every offensive and defensive coordinator shouldn't be a head coach. I don't and and I don't know who fits the category or, or that criteria or not, mm-hmm. but we've seen great well, we've offensive seen and defensive coordinators right, right. get the opportunity to lead a team mm-hmm. and get outside of their comfort zone. Yep. Right? Mm-hmm. So if I was Brian, I would hang with Josh Allen in Buffalo for at least two more years to really get that thing going like to really get it going okay so out of the three we talked about um let's just look at it from this angle dayball sala and the enemy which one do you think is going to be the best head coach when they eventually become one and i know a lot of it has to do with situation but just mm-hmm. let's just say for sake of discussion all three land in a quote-unquote ideal situation which one do you think has the best career as a head coach? I think uh, Robert uh, Solid because his ability to reach his players, right? Look at how Pete Carroll runs his organization. Mm-hmm. Nobody's more animated as a head coach on the side of right. Pete Carroll. Right, right. Right. Yeah. The team feeds off of that. Mm-hmm. You score a touchdown, Pete Carroll, and his old ass is running down the sideline. He <laughs> right. jumping up. He he diving on Russell Wilson and mm-hmm. like Robert Sala is the same way with his defense, right? Have you been watching? Did you watch the way they just played? Right, like for all intents and purposes, the whole defense is 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 hurt. IR, COVID list, the whole season, mm-hmm. but yet those guys are playing with everything they have. Mm-hmm. If you have a coach that can resonate with players like that, that's Mm. invaluable. Okay. He's doing it with the defensive side of the ball. So just imagine if he had the whole entire team buying in to his energy, what that would look like. So that's why I give the nod to Robert Sala. Okay. Fair enough. So, um, let's switch it up a little bit. Look at, uh, another part of the game from, I guess, more a, player perspective so um i'm a couple years younger than you i graduated high school in nine, 1996 that means oh, you're you're a baby, man. You're a <laughs> that means um we came up kind of in a similar era where the running yeah, back yeah. was the glory position in football and longtime listeners and watchers of the format podcast know that i have 
two simple things that I believe in when it comes to being successful as a football team. And that's run the football, stop the run. Run the ball, stop the run. I truly believe in that, right? So I say that to say we hear a lot about the running game and the running back position being devalued. But if you notice, and I know you see it as an offensive lineman, for the most part, the teams that run the ball and stop the run well have the most success. You're looking at Cleveland, Baltimore, Tennessee, Green Bay. Green Bay was having a couple of quote unquote down years. They get Aaron Jones in there to take just a little bit of the pressure off Aaron Rodgers. And now look at how they're just churning along. Teams that, mm -hmm. um, San Francisco, they don't necessarily have elite wide out or quarterback talent, but they can run the football. And as you just mentioned with Robert Sala, the defense um, does a, a fair job stopping the run. To me, these seem like basic football tenets that equals success. So why is there such a push on the narrative that you don't need to run the ball and that the running game is less important than it is? I know it's um, not as sexy as throwing it all over the yard and all that, but where well, that it's it, it's a quarterback's league. It's the same reason why there will be no other MVP of the league other than the quarterback, unless someone in the receiver or running back position breaks a long-standing record. Mm -hmm. Right? You need a, you need a running back to rush for twenty two hundred yards, or you need a receiver <laughs> to catch over twenty one hundred, you you know, yards receiving. Mm -hmm. That's the only way they'll be considered as an MVP. The notion that you can't be a good team without the quarterback all this lends to the devaluing of the running back position mm -hmm. the running back position comes into play in december and in january if you can run the football when the weather you watch that green bay game right oh, yeah. you saw what it looked like out there oh yeah right when the weather turns like that mm -hmm. right you must be able to hand the ball off mm -hmm. 25 30 times and be productive with your offense. Mm -hmm. That's the value of a running back. Prior to these months where the weather changes, yeah, we rush for 60, 70 yards a game. Yeah, we get it. You know, most of the time, well, back in the day, it used to be about ball control, mm -hmm. right? Time of possession. We can possess the ball longer, we can win. But then you had quarterbacks coming in who didn't need a lot of time to score. Peyton Manning could be down by 10 with three minutes in the game and win. He didn't need a lot of time because he's so dynamic and precise with the ball. So but, once that started to happen, uh -huh. the value of quarterback shot through the roof. Remember the days of the 85 Bears? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Get, get into the Super Bowl, win a Super Bowl. Yep. G Jim McMahon was not a great quarterback. Right. The world loved him. The country loved him because right. he's flash. He had the headband yeah. and he was right. But he, he get his numbers, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. he, he wasn't mm -hmm. a great quarterback. That defense and Walter Payton right. was why the Bulls and it's still, I mean, the, excuse me, the, Bear, the Bears right. won that Super Bowl. Right. And it's still a shame that, uh, Refrigerator Perry got the yeah, touchdown and yeah. not Walter Payton. Yeah, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Right. <laughs> um, and, and, and then you fast forward to a team like the 2000 Baltimore Ravens, right? Love those right? guys. You, right. You, you, you lean, you, you, you would lean on that defense in that running game and not, uh, what was it? Uh, Brad Johnson, right? Or was it Trent, Trent Dilford? Dilford? Trent, Trent Dilford. Mm -hmm. And then for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with Brad Johnson. Yep. It was Warren Sapp, Simeon, right? It was those guys, mm -hmm. right? And then the running, Mike Allstead, the, the, the running game. That is now shifted. You can't do that anymore. The last time that happened was the Bears recently with Rex Grossman at quarterback. Mm -hmm. But let me push back on that a little bit, right? So I get push what away. you're saying, but you, you got, for instance, the Rams and Sean McVay. Everybody thinks they're a flashy offensive team, but Sean McVay will tell you at its core, that offense is a power running offense. You mentioned Peyton Manning earlier, but for his whole career, Edron James and Joseph Adai, again, a power running offense where you could, yeah. they were throwing it, but they were doing a lot on the ground. I, the I, I understand that, but look at the numbers. Look at the receivers' numbers. Right. right? Yeah, I'm a Marvin I mean, Harrison had, guy, so I hear you. Sean, Sean, Sean McVay had 2,000 yard receivers. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, Woods and Cup. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So, 
and even before then, even back then, when um, uh, Brandon Cooks was there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Right? Okay. So when you look at Peyton Manning and Edron James, as good as he was, right? And Joseph Adai, as good as he was, you look at Marvin Harris and you look at Reggie Wayne. Mm -hmm. Right? At the yeah. same time, both of those receivers were well over a 1,000 yards apiece. Right. Right. right? And you just go right on down the line. That is what is happening. Although, so, so it shifted from being able to run the ball to open up the pass, mm -hmm. right? Because if you can run the ball, you can't play with two high safeties. Soon as that right. single high safety somebody's shows gotta up, come down in the box, yeah. Peyton Manning is checking out of whatever run they had and mm -hmm. they're going deep. Right. That's that's where the game is changed. And you need the quarterback to be able to do that. I yeah, I get it. I mean, I guess I just Look, I'm an it, offensive you know, lineman. I don't want right. to fight. I would rather run the ball. Like, hell, <laughs> right. I, I don't, I no, I mean, I, I, don't, I, get it. I guess I, I value. I love running backs. Right. All right. I yeah. love running backs. Jamal right. Anderson is was one of the greatest running backs uh, that I ever had the pleasure of blocking for because mm -hmm. he never came out of the game. Right. Right. Twenty yard run. He get back in the hut. Now you do seven yards. You go to the sideline. Somebody else come in. Like, wait a minute. I, I I remember being in the huddle and asked Jamal, like, how come you'll never get out? He was like, I'm never going to let somebody have my yards. <laughs> I'm never, I'm never going to have somebody let somebody have my yards. Right. Wow. You don't okay. see that now. So my mentality as an offensive lineman is, mm. yo, man, get in here. Right. Okay. Clinton Portis, when I was in Denver, I used to be like, yo, man, come get these yards. Right. 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 Let's go. Let's get these. Don't nobody do this like you. Right. Right. So yeah. that's now shifted. So now you need two running backs, three running backs. Hell, uh, uh, Seattle, they got about five running backs over there they can yeah, use. Yeah. San Francisco, like we don't, I don't know who gonna start for the they got so many right. damn running backs, right? right? So then you look at the you look at the two-headed monster in Cleveland with Chubb and and uh Kareem Hunt. And, they and with make, all they can with make all of that so much easier. With yeah. all of that said, you still need a quarterback. You still need Baker Mayfield throw the ball down the field. I hear you. I just, I don't know. I guess the way I see the game, and I will certainly defer to your expertise. I guess the way I see it is when you have that productive running game, you don't have to put as much on the quarterback. You're right. And that, that in a perfect world, that is the, that is the ideal situation. Mm -hmm. But teams have been so unique on defense, mm -hmm. right? They can take the run away from you. Right. So that's where, right. When you take the run away, you have to be able to pass the ball. Look at New England. Cam Newton can't throw the ball down the field with any right. type of accuracy. Right. So what do you do? You stop them from running the ball. What right. do they have? Right. Nothing. But that goes to my point. So remember, my, my point on the running game is twofold. Run the ball, mm -hmm. stop the run. So that, mm -hmm. to me, what you just said shows you just how important having a running game is. So I guess we could go in a circle on this all day. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I think that's interesting. But um, moving on to, to, to my, next, uh, my next point, um, as we were talking about quarterbacks just now, and this is something I think is so interesting, it's not too long ago that African-American quarterbacks didn't get a whole lot of opportunity at the starting job. Um, a lot of times, even if they were outstanding in college, they would come to the NFL, they would get converted, you know, uh, looking way back, Warren Moon, arguably the best black quarterback of all time, had to spend his first six years of his pro career playing in Canada because he wasn't going to get a shot in the NFL. And now we're seeing, you know, arguably four out of the top 10 quarterbacks in the league are black. And that's, you know, Tremendous. Russell Wilson, Patrick Mahomes, Deshaun Watson, Lamar Jackson, Cam Newton's a former MVP. Justin Fields at Ohio State is looked at as the second best quarterback prospect in the draft. What do you think is lending towards uh, all the success that these African-American quarterbacks are having? Um, the league has changed. The prototypical quarterback used to be Dan Marino. Mm -hmm. Right? It used to be um uh, uh John Elway mm -hmm. right it used to be tall stand in the pocket deliver the ball down the field mm -hmm. now as offenses have changed mobility at the quarterback position is 
at just athleticism in general at the quarterback position is now a value commodity before it was a distraction. Right. Right. Oh, he runs too much. Uh, he needs to just be able to be a pocket passer mm -hmm. and what well, defenses are too smart. They're smarter and they're too fast for that mm -hmm. to happen now. Okay. The lack of great offensive line play has also diminished throughout the league. Yeah. So you have to be able to have a quarterback who's resourceful. Now, historically, the most resourceful and athletic quarterbacks have been African American. Mm -hmm. You have some outliers uh, in terms of Josh Allen, mm -hmm. uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew uh, uh, Luck, mm -hmm. or right? as, mm -hmm. as much as a, a pocket passer he was, if you look at him in RG3's rookie year, they were going back and forth in terms of uh, rushing yards. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You look at uh, Aaron Rodgers, his ability, the things that made him so special is his ability to make throws on the run. Brett Favre. Right. Same thing. Yeah. Brett Favre. Mm -hmm. Right. So but historically, you got more athleticism in, in African-American quarterbacks. The knock was they can't make decisions and they can't lead a team. Mm -hmm. But African-Americans have been dealing with this in American society since they brought us over here. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm hmm. It was shout out to Doug Williams for dispelling yeah. any of that. Right. Right. And and so now there are more young quarterbacks, African American young quarterbacks playing football in high in Pop Warner, high school, college, and now in the pros. Beforehand, it was they would take those guys at quarterback and move them, right? So once they got mm -hmm. to a certain spot, they would uh, a certain point in their career because there was wasn't a lot of African American quarterbacks. They would say, "Well, you could play receiver. You'd be better mm -hmm. at DB, DB, right?" Yeah. That's not that's not happening anymore, right? So the more and more it's accepted and needed at the top level in the in the NFL, mm -hmm. the more and more we'll see young black quarterbacks starting at pop Warner all the way through and, and being able to play at that high level. Fair enough. And uh, so the last thing I'm going to ask you about, um, who do you see winning each conference and then coming out on top in the Super Bowl? Obviously the NFL is so great in terms of parity um, every year you have worst to first, first to worst. It's not like the NBA where you can pretty much assume who's going to come out, you know, barring anything, you know, any major injuries or anything that what do you what are you looking at in terms of the playoffs in both conferences and then the Super Bowl winner? Well, the AFC to me is easy, although I do like Buffalo. I do like uh, a Miami team that's that's surging. Um, we don't really know what we're going to get with Pittsburgh. Right. Right. I would have started off hot now we're like oh we don't know who's gonna show up right they right. still can't run the ball which you need to do in the playoffs uh so for yeah, me run as the Kansas, ball, that's stop the run there we of go. course of course <laughs> that's 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 kansas city yeah right so kansas city and patrick mahomes and and, and the, the, just the the mind of eric bien and and uh it, it's just and andy reed it's just mm -hmm. it's too much to overcome we've mm -hmm. seen them be behind in all of their games in the playoffs last year, including Crazy. the Super Bowl, and it doesn't matter. Never seen anything like that. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter. Right. So with that, we know that they're never out of a game, which is dangerous. And so I picked them in the AFC. So before I let you go on to the NFC, um, do you think that this is a year that Baltimore and Lamar Jackson can get that elusive playoff win, or um, you know, maybe even make a run, maybe get to the conference? Well, they got to get in. I first. know a lot of it is matchups. I, I believe they gotta get, get in. in. They're not even. In, they're not in yet. I believe they'll. Well, even if they went out, they need a little help. Um, I think. Yeah. So think we we don't even in. know. Let's say if they get in, and I, I, I mean, you pulling the NFL. for them. You're you're pulling. Right. For I am. Them. I am. You, I know. I should be objective so as a journalist. You're <laughs> you're asking a personal question <laughs> right am, now. I am. And they're not even in the playoffs, so right. I refuse <laughs> to answer that question. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. So let's let's go over to the NFC. Um, what do you see in the NFC? So what I saw, what I see in the NFC is Aaron Rodgers is playing lights out football. Yeah, I mean, good lord, that combined with a resurgence uh, on the defensive side of the ball, mm -hmm. they got a couple key injuries out, but 
the way they're getting after the passer and the fact that teams are going to have to go to Lambo. Yeah. They're going to have to go through yeah. Lambo. Yeah. Right. And they Possibly look like they may have to gotten get a, to the Super Bowl. They look like they may have gotten a second back with what you saw from AJ Dillon the other night. You saw Boston College AJ. That, bro, if you combine him with Aaron Jones, big. that could be dangerous. Uh, Dillon is a big, big, big running back. Yes. Kind of so, reminds me of the bus. So like or, you know, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Henry, with a little bit more speed. Of, yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, so watching the weather and what I, I played in Green Bay in January. Mm-hmm. That Not ain't fun. what you want, bro. That ain't what you want. <laughs> you, 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 don't, you don't want that. They, it make you think different. You when you come out of that tunnel, uh-huh. Yeah, you in the locker room and it's warm and you getting mm-hmm. pumped up and you like, yeah, I ain't wearing no sleeves. And then you got your music on, and then right. you come up, you pray as a team, and then you go out and you come out that tunnel, that mm-hmm. tunnel, and that hawk hit you in your face, mm-hmm. change your whole mind. Like you'd be like, oh, <laughs> your lips chapped, your hands frozen, <laughs> your toes frozen. Right. Bro, it's just a different dynamic. Okay. They thrive in that. That's why they have the best home record in December and January mm-hmm. up there. Right. Because it's hard to play there. Mm-hmm. Aaron Rodgers playing the way he's playing. The yeah. running game and that defense coming alive makes me think that it's going to be Green Bay coming out of the NFC. So it'll be Green Bay and um, and Kansas City in the Super Bowl. Let me ask you this. I, and I, I like that. That sounds like an intriguing matchup. But let's just say... Because we know, and again, I'm going to mention your FS1 uh, compatriot, Rob Parker, who was very adamant all season long and to start the season that uh, Tampa Bay was not going to make the playoffs. So he lost a lot of wing bets on that one. But um, (laughs) you're looking at now Tom Brady, who, in fairness, has never made it to a Super Bowl when he didn't have home field or didn't have a bye or had to play multiple road playoff games. But who knows what could happen here? And I think we can argue, we can argue that he's the best cold weather quarterback of all time. So if Tampa Bay has to go up there, do you think he could win that game? I think anytime you have uh, Tom Brady under center, he can win a game. Mm -hmm. What about the rest of the team though? Right. The highly undisciplined team that he's still rocking with. Yeah. That's a problem. Right. Like, so as Tampa Bay is Tampa Bay. Now they Mm -hmm. not, he came from new England. Right. They didn't. <laughs> they didn't. Right. You going to play in that Hawk like that, bro. I'm yeah. telling you, man. Right. Mm-hmm. Receivers hands, just not as <laughs> you get a lot of that. going on. <laughs> right. Right. Offensive right. linemen. All of a sudden they got sleeves on defensive ends. Don't want to. Right. So it's just not Tom Brady. Okay. Like you right. go to play new England. I mean, excuse me, uh, to Green Bay mm-hmm. and home, and they're acclimated to it. That makes a difference, man. Yeah. So who else, what other team in the NFC do you think could make some noise and possibly challenge Green Bay for coming out of that conference? I would have to say, you know, you can never count out the Saints. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, Drew Brees hasn't been the Drew Brees we've known in the past. No, I think it's over for him. But he's still the all-time leader in uh, the majority of, of, of all passing categories. Right. And Father Time is a beast. And when mm-hmm. you know it's nipping at your heels, mm-hmm. you may pull something out of your hat one final time. Mm-hmm. Is this the year for that one final time? Right. I mean, Alvin Kamara is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a matchup nightmare. And hopefully they get Michael Thomas back. If they don't right. get Michael Thomas back, they don't have a shot. Okay. Um, real quick, uh, before I let you go, uh, back to the AFC real quick. If Cleveland makes it, do you think they win a playoff game? I think they do. They've got a lot of I talent. They, have, they seem to have the they formula. Have the formula. They, have play they have the formula. To, right. They have the formula to, to win a playoff game. They do. Okay. Which would be a great step for them. Right? Absolutely. They can build on that, right? Mm-hmm. So they'll win a playoff game. They'll get beat the next round. But mm-hmm. then you can build off that. Mm-hmm. You found something in Baker. It resonates. Mm-hmm. If I was them, I would trade OBJ. Right. That's just me. Yep. Get some valuable a- uh, uh, assets or some draft picks for OBJ mm-hmm. um, because I think they can build their team better without him. Okay. 
All right, and that's it. Um, thank you so much, Ephraim, for uh, coming course, on, brother. sharing your experience, sharing your knowledge, giving us some real valuable uh, NFL info here. And before you go, why don't you let all the people know where they can find you? Uh, I'm at Ephraim Salam on Twitter, Salam 74 on Instagram. I'm on uh, Fox Sports Radio uh, from, what is it, 5 to 8 and 8 to 11, depending on, you know, 5 to 8 Pacific Standard Time, <laughs> yeah. 8 to 11 Eastern Standard Time uh, on Saturdays. Come check me out. I got the same energy, same everything. And, you know, happy New Year's to everybody. Good stuff, man. Well, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to have you back on, talk to us a little bit more. Uh, Absolutely. Anytime little, little you need me, man, you just let me know. Hey, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest Absolutely. of your day. Absolutely. You too, bro. All right.